This morning we have Pablo with us. Pablo has always been interested in reconciliation and peacemaking. He first had to reconcile with himself because of his own diverse cultural backgrounds. Namely, he is Korean and Paraguayan and American. Pablo is also interested in the social dimension of reconciliation and peacemaking, especially in how immigrant communities can build trust and work together towards social justice with others in their new but foreign communities. Pablo completed his undergraduate studies in Asuncion, Paraguay, and he then earned a Master of Arts in Intercultural Studies and a Master of Divinity at Fuller Theological Seminary, where he met and married his wife, Gina. During his time in Los Angeles, he served for two years as the lead pastor of a Korean Mennonite church. He then earned his master's in theology at Boston College, and now he's in his fifth year of a PhD program at Emmanuel College in Toronto. And he's also pastor for the Toronto Mennonite New Life Church. Although Pablo was raised Presbyterian, he became a Mennonite because of his strong conviction in the gospel of peace. And so this morning, Pablo will be helping us to think about what it means to be church together while we work on or look at and watch the practice of making kimchi. Thank you, Pablo, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited about this workshop, and I hope you're excited as well. Uh, just to see, uh, I would like to see how many people are really going to make kimchi with me together. Can you raise your hand and maybe wave your hand? I'll just go through all this screen. Oh, wow. There's a lot of people. And of course, uh, some kimchi is not for everyone. It's, and it's totally okay if you don't like the smell or the taste. Just whoever is just courageous enough and will, willing to take some risk. I oh, think well. this is the opportunity for you to take a good risk here. Um, so uh, I just want to let, first recognize and acknowledge that this workshop was actually a one full day workshop where I had to shrink and uh, make it every condense it to one and a half hours. So I won't be able to touch everything. And I just want to also let you know that kimchi won't solve all the church problem and conflicts. Uh, but I believe it is something that can, is inspired and give us some insight and a good way to start our conversation about our courageous imagination. Also, I want to acknowledge that in the process of making this workshop, Matthew Bailey Dick, who in the past served as the Anabaptist Learning Workshop Coordinator, he really inspired and helped me to develop. So it's not fully my own creativity that came up with this workshop. Just want to acknowledge that. All right. Well, then we'll dive into our kimchi making and today, uh, today's presentation and workshop. Um, first, before we talk about kimchi, I would like to invite you to utilize the chat features and write the comments that I'm about to ask. Um, when you think about diversity and differences, what are some images that come to you? Pictures or metaphors? Don't use kimchi, that is already taken by me. Use other images and metaphors. What are some images and metaphors that come to you when you think about diversity and differences? Here, uh, I'll give you one example, uh, one uh, very uh, well-known example, especially more in the US context, is the melting pot. It's the picture that you can see on the left. Yes, someone said fruit, uh, soup, quilt, mosaic. Yes, they're great images. Uh, but one predominant images in the US is melting pot. It's like gathering all people from diverse background and racial background together and mix together. But what are the problem with this? From my perspective, I see by wanting to mix everyone, what happened is that you melt all the essential and the creativities and the uniqueness of all ethno-cultural background and you mix to this something and make a soup or just commagulate and mix them all together. That it loses the uniqueness of all in each individual ethnocultural backgrounds. So then in Canada, as you can see on the right of your screen, people prefer to use what's called a mosaic. 
uh, is where uh, people from diverse ethnocultural people uh, background gather together and they are standing side by side. I, I think this picture is better than the one on the left, but I also have an issue with this image because people are standing side by side and there's a strong boundary between each pieces of mosaic. And so then there's no really a true and authentic engagement that's happening. So as I ponder and think, what could be a better image, an alternative for this image where each uniqueness could be respected, but then there's also this picture and idea of a true engagement. And therefore I came up, I chose this metaphor of kimchi. And throughout this today's workshop, I'll explain further to you. But I think it will be good for those who are not familiar with uh, kimchi and some historical background. Um, my wife, Gina In, who did a pre-recording, will share with you briefly about, uh, about kimchi in the Korean tradition. My name is Gina Im. I'm from Toronto United Mennonite Church. I'm originally from South Korea, and now I am living in Toronto, Canada. I'm living with Pablo, who is from Paraguay, and also with my 10-month-old baby, Loa, who was born in Toronto, Canada. So my family already has some intercultural aspects. I'm very happy to share about kimchi today which represents my Korean culture. I'm going to give you some brief information about what kimchi is and also share some of my reflection on kimchi as a metaphor of intercultural church. This picture shows a typical Korean meal. Steamed rice is an essential element of the Korean meal. Rice goes with a soup and various side dishes. Kimchi is one of the side dishes made from salted vegetables. In the old days, kimchi was an important source of fiber and vitamins in the winter when people couldn't find the fresh vegetables. Since kimchi is not an expensive food like meats at the time, it was accessible to everyone from the rich to the poor. How many types of kimchi do you recognize in this picture? I see two of them, radish kimchi and cabbage kimchi. There are many kinds of kimchi in Korea. How many types of kimchi have you tried before? People say that there are more than 200 kinds of kimchi in Korea. I haven't experienced all of them. Kimchi varies by climate, geographical conditions, local ingredients, methods of preparation and preservation. These are typical kimchi you can easily find in Korean restaurants. As you see, there are cucumber kimchi and radish kimchi. And there is also water kimchi, which is like a cold soup, but needs to be fermented. Napa cabbage kimchi is the most well-known kimchi and we are going to make it today. One thing I would like to inform you is that traditionally kimchi making is a communal work. In the old days, the Koreans lived with their extended family members in a large big village. After harvesting cabbages and vegetables during four seasons, people would pick a day which is a kimchi making day and they marked on their calendar. All the family members got together and made kimchi with hundreds of cabbages. Can you see this pile of cabbage? These days, many Koreans live as a nuclear family in apartments, but my mother's generation and some of my generation still make kimchi together. So it is truly a communal work. Kimchi was traditionally stored in jars and placed them in underground to keep cool and unfrozen during the winter. With the advance of technology, these days kimchi refrigerators are more commonly used to store kimchi 
During the winter season, we enjoy different taste of kimchi as it gets more fermented. So, kimchi making involves the art of fermentation. When it is fully fermented, it tastes tender and smells stronger. So we make a soup with kimchi, tofu, pork, and vegetables, and it is called kimchi jjigae. We also make a kimchi fried rice or kimchi pancake. As you can see, kimchi is very versatile. As we discuss how to build a healthy Christian community, I think a kimchi gives us some good insights to chew on. First, as I shared earlier, kimchi has been a nutritious food that everyone can enjoy. Kimchi was accessible to everyone from the rich to the poor. And I believe the biblical vision of the community of Jesus is also inviting everyone to join, regardless of their social and economic status. Secondly, there are various types of kimchi depending on the geographical condition, local ingredients, and the recipe of each household. It has been contextualized. There is no standard kimchi. I believe the community of Jesus is also needs to be contextualized and embedded into the culture where the gospel of Jesus is shared because Jesus incarnated and lived in a specific time and location. This invites us to consider where we are living and how our church reflects the diversity of our society. I share that the kimchi making is a communal work. I believe that the church building is definitely a communal work. People with different gifts are called to build the community of Jesus. Kimchi invites us to ponder on questions like, is our church led by only one person or by a certain dominant group of people? Are there anybody who cannot fully speak of their voices because of any kind of barriers? Are we welcoming and celebrating the differences of one another? Kimchi is the art of fermentation. It takes time. It also transforms as it gets fermented. Church is also alive and dynamic. It is not static. There might be honeymoon stage, conflict stage, and reconciliation stage. As we go through these stages, we learn and mature. Lastly, as I told you before, we can make different dishes using fully fermented kimchi, such as kimchi fried rice, pancake, and soup. The mission of church can be diverse depending on where the churches are or what kind of gifts the communities have. We can't just stay as a cage kimchi. God is calling us to serve the world in various ways. As I wrap up, I would like to invite you to read these five sentences together as it is written. And if you want, you can replace the word kimchi to church. One. Kimchi is accessible to everyone. Two, kimchi has been contextualized. Three, kimchi making is a communal work. Four, kimchi is the art of fermentation. Five, every kimchi has its own mission. Thank you for your listening and your participation, and I hope you enjoy kimchi making. I hope you have enjoyed uh, the presentation by Gina. Uh, just to let you know, uh, she was not able to join us because she had to take our 10 months old baby Loa out into a stroller. Okay, um, well, welcome back. Uh, I just want to ask a few more comments about kimchi. First, kimchi is not a vegetarian dish, although there's so many vegetables here and there. 
Um, as you can see the ingredients, there's still um, there's anchovy sauce and sh fermented shrimp. And so um, the, it's not a vegetarian dish. Also I want to add that kimchi making has been evolving throughout history, tradition, location. And so people are coming up with so many different creative ways. So today's making of kimchi is not the way, it's just one of the way of making kimchi. Also, I know there are people who are very more conscious and mindful about the ingredients, how these ingredients came here, how have they been harvested. And I know some of the, how anchovy and other seafood ingredients have been uh, done illegally and used a lot of uh, illegal labor people. And I believe on the, I was told on Netflix, there's uh, uh, a, a documentary that talks about that. I think it's called Cispiracy. Um, so, so I just want to let you know before I start making kimchi. In general, this today's kimchi making uh, is the simplest and the easiest way you can make kimchi. So uh, once you learn this, don't tell other people that you have mastered kimchi because this is just the beginning level. I only, I'm only familiar at this level. I'm not a professional or master chef in kimchi making. Um, in today's kimchi making, there's uh, largely two different stages. One is mostly chopping and brining. And the second one is um, making the sauce and mixing with our rest of the ingredients. And so I'll go through step by step. In order to save time, I believe we were uh, we told people to have our ingredients all washed as much as possible and chopped. Um, I chop other ingredients, but for the Nafa cabbage, I'll show you how to cut into pieces. So. In order for a kimchi to be eatable for a bite size, I have to be cut into by four, four by four centimeter. Um, and so to help you with that, how to cut them to those small, smaller pieces, I have one kilo of Napa cabbage, which is already cut into half. Usually there are two kilo and this cut into half. Um, so I'll show you how to cut them to smaller pieces. First, let's take our um, outer leaf because they're not edible. I mean, if you want to, you can, but um, uh, we prefer not to have this outer leaf. Next, I'll cut this into half. This way. All right. In order to help with the cutting process, I'll make sure to take the stem out because this is not edible as well. And in order to all of them to have a similar size, what I do is I take out the inner part out because they are smaller. Uh, width Y, and I start cutting them by four centimeter. And I put them to my container that I have here. And the more outer area to make all the pieces to even out well, I'm going to cut this into half. and start chopping them by four centimeter. It doesn't need to be perfect. And I'll just do the similar step with my second part of my Napa cabbage. I'm taking out the inner part, chopping them. I'm cutting the outer leaves into half. And then I'm going to wash this 
not the cabbage pieces. I'm aware that not everyone could go as fast as I can. Some of you could go faster than me, but I know that not many of you can go as fast as I can. Uh, don't worry, we'll be sending you a separate instruction recipe of how to make kimchi. So if you, some of you, you're behind, don't be discouraged. We'll send you further instruction how to make them in your own time. Okay, I feel like it's ready for wash. I'll put it, I'll empty the water from the container. And we want to start with the brining process. So uh, with the coarse salt, I have here, oops, one third. I'll take care of that later. Uh, we'll spread the salt. Make sure they're mixed well. And rub them, you know, rub the salt with the Napa cabbage pieces to help with the brining process. Rub them thoroughly. Making sure the salts are not only one area, but well spread out. All right, I feel like this is good enough. And I will just cover it, this container so that nothing go inside here. I'll just wash my hand here. Also, we'll be cutting our green onion and chives. Again, to speed up with the process, I've already washed and um, cut them to pieces. I invite you, those who are cutting, to cut them right now, to wash them and cut them as we continue with our program. Is there any urgent question that some of you want to ask? If it is, you could leave it in the chat box and maybe one of our staff members could help out and maybe read if there's some urgent and important messages. Um, so I'm on for um, reading some questions. So is dealing with and composting the inedible parts of our diversity part of the metaphor? That's a question Stephen Reist is asking. Interesting ah, question. What do we do with the, the inedible parts of church, of kimchi? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I have not thought, but let me give some thought to that and I'll make sure to come back to that question. I was mm -hmm. more asking about the kimchi making process right now in case there's people who are stuck in a certain process and steps so that feel like they can go to the next step. All right. Sorry, I've got it. Um, there Sorry. are no questions about that right now. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, now I'm here in the kitchen, as you can see, I'll be moving to the living room. During that moment, I want to invite you to use that chat box, the chat features, and try to answer the question that I'll be giving, up, giving to you. And that is, um, what are the similarity and differences between these ingredients, chive, green onion, napa cabbage, garlic, Asian pears, what are some similarities and differences? And feel free to use, to answer that by using the chat features. And maybe Marilyn, will you be able to read some of the comments that people are- I can writing? read the comments, yes. So uh, God is shaping us and lovingly drawing us into each other's lives, like Pablo and all of us are shaping the cabbages to easily mix with other ingredients. 
some chopping may be necessary, but a chopping that doesn't change who we as people and the cultures we come from, who we are as people. To be part of the body of Christ needs an intentional mixing up as Pablo's recipe. And from Craig, the composting question reminds me of another old farming metaphor that applies to the church also, where there is no manure, there's no milk. Um, differences, some of them, uh, the ingredients, uh, I am very familiar with, others I have never cooked with. The ingredients are alive and growing. The ingredients are pretty different in taste, but also yummy. Cabbage is a large vegetable, provides bulk. Onions are small, but provide flavor. Flavors and textures, um, each ingredient brings nutrition. We need variety to get a healthy balance. Mm. Some grow wild near our houses and others don't. Again, the flavor. Together, food uh, it mixes and nourishes our bodies. Each ingredient is unique and strongly flavored. Together, they blend and make something delicious. Wonderful. Thank you for reading and thank you for your all uh, great uh, comments. Um, so before we go to a, uh, oh, have more time, you all have opportunity and chance to have further discussion. But before we go to our breakout rooms, I want to show you what's called a diversity wheel. So this, what this diversity wheel is showing how all these different factors influence us how to be, how we are diverse and different. Of course, uh, they are not the only factors, they are more than this, but there are a few factors that really shape and influence us to be different and diverse. And some of them, as you can see, is biological, and some of them are constructed, which means our society and our culture influence us and push us to be diverse and differences. And I invite you to look at this will for a moment. And we'll soon go into our breakout rooms, to a breakout room, to a room, a small group of six to seven people. And within your group, I invite you to um, discuss about these following questions. First, comment about how we are similar and different from each other. Also, are differences good or bad? Why? And why not? And lastly, how are we supposed to be a church with such diversity and differences? Should we accept differences or should we simply cover or ignore differences? So you will have eight minutes into your group. I invite you to talk and have this uh, meaningful conversation within your breakout rooms. See you later very good conversation. I know with our breakout room, it's always, uh, we need more time for further discussion, but this is just the nature of our breakout rooms. Um, I just want to invite maybe two or three of you to share in this large group what you have discussed. And the rest of, of people could maybe write, use the chat features and write down some insight or some idea or some interesting comment that you have heard that to share with a large group using the chat features. And also inviting two, maybe two or three people to share by speaking out what has been discussed in your small groups. My wife made some notes, sense of adventure because we're different and uh, evolutionary, go with gifts, not gender. All worship the same Jesus. Thank you. There are some comments here. Um, differences in diversity really depend on context. Thankful for the earlier metaphor. Uh, relationship building and food go well together. Some differences are more challenging than others, especially the non-visible worldview ones and fermentation changes the ingredients themselves. Mm. 
Ah, here's another one. We had a very worthwhile discussion noted that similarity and sameness often bring comfort and a sense of safety. It takes more effort to be in a situation or church with greater diversity. And as it is, there are many parts, but one body, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. So that there should be no division in the body and that, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. So that's a helpful uh, reminder from scripture. We are diverse, but we feel the similarities. This is a good feeling. We each have a story and we need to acknowledge where we stand as we listen to other stories. This is a fantastic way of communicating through metaphor. If we had five to six of these recorded from different food or ethnic backgrounds, it would make an excellent resource series to use at church, it invites participation and inclusion. Yeah, I noticed earlier, somebody said, what's next year's workshop? Maybe it's egg rolls or something. Um, we all want peace. We enjoy life, have some, have strong family on mission and be one in Jesus. Love must be what guides all of us. Differences can be gifts rather than barriers. Uh, in one group, Gordon noticed that it is easier to build community in diversity if we have a common task. Sometimes we are more prepared to deal with obvious differences than the subtle ones. And diversity makes for a delicious potluck. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn, for reading the comments. Thank you again for your engaging conversation and your comments. That's very helpful. Again, today's workshop won't solve all the problem and all the issue, just a beginning people to imagine and to have this uh, very rich conversation within our Mennonite churches, Anabaptist Mennonite churches. Uh, in differences in our society usually uh, can be treated positively as some of you have mentioned and some, of, and some differences could be treated negatively but uh, it is much more common that they are viewed negatively because uh, it shakes that status quo. It shakes what is common and what is called the norm of the society. And so um, differences, some people consider as a threat as well. Uh, for this well-known theologian and missiologist called Robert Schreiler, he explained that throughout human history, there are at least five strategic postures that do not respect differences and try to collapse what is perceived as other into the same or exclude, excluded. So one of the strategic posture is uh, some people tend to homogenize the other by ignoring or downplaying the differences that exist between people so that the other is perceived as not that different from oneself. And this method, this method pressures the other to conform and to assimilate to the dominant group. And if the other does not conform, the dominant people categorize the other as a source of problem and disunity. Another um, posture is colonize the other by including them coercively to direct or indirect means. And often education and religion are used to fix or erase the differences from the other. Another posture is um, demonize the other by believing that differences in the other is so extreme that it become a threat to one's community and unity. And so the other should be excluded. And usually the dominant group is considered the normal and the neutral, and the other is a deviant of the norm. Another strategy is that uh, it, some people romanticize the other because the other is seen as so unique and superior in its otherness. Although no, co no active coercion is involved in this method, it is still a form of colonizing because the other here often bear the projection of ideals from a dominant group imagination. Idealizing is a form of colonizing. And lastly, uh, some people uh, 
strategic is that pluralizing the other by believing that differences does not make any difference because we are all different. This approach is actually tantamount to denial and in effect, it seeks to homogenize the others. Of course, there are so many different ways how people downplay differences or try to disregard and disrespect. Uh, but this is, I believe, um, five well-represented ways of how society and, and churches could disrespect differences. As an alternative, what I'm suggesting is for an intercultural relationship. And bringing that to the church context, I'm advocating for an intercultural church that is based on Anabaptist Mennonite faith. And what does that look like? We'll talk more on the second part after making the second stage of the kimchi. Um, but in a nutshell, what I am arguing for or advocating is that differences should be respected, embraced it, and engaged. Focusing both the differences and similarity is important in becoming an intercultural church. So I'll move back to my kitchen. Um, there was, no, actually, um, pa yeah. Pablo, there was one question about who is the author that you were quoting and um, oh, maybe yes. when we send out further information uh, for the kimchi, we can include the name in, in book. But yes. Did you just want to say now? Yes. Uh, his name is Robert Schreider. He's a, Schreider. Okay. a theologian and missiologist. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. Before going to the kitchen, there's an uh, important process to do here in my dining room. So far, you have seen my dining room in my uh, kitchen. You just see my bathroom and uh, bedroom. You'll see everything about my apartment here. So this is the moment where we create kimchi sauce. So you need a blender for this. I hope you have prepared. Um, and here, again, to speed up with the process, um, I already gather all the ingredients that needs to be mixed. I have here two tablespoons of rice. I have kochukaru, it's Korean red chili powder. I have anchovy sauce, um, sugar, two tablespoons, fermented shrimp. Also, I already cut them to pieces, sorry. Um, uh, but Asian pear, apple. You don't need to peel the apple, but if you want, you could feel, feel free to do that. Ginger, onion, oh, I mean, garlic, of course, and onion. And also one third cup of water. So I'm going to put all this together. For your information, uh, it is the rice and the fermented shrimp that helps with the fermentation here. Without those two elements, the fermentation does not happen. But of course, as I said earlier, the anchovies, I mean, the, uh, the fermented shrimp is not the only way to, to make the fermented kimchi. So you can use different ingredients for the fermentation. There's a, a question about what if we, somebody doesn't have the fermented shrimp? Uh, if you could, that rice could also help that process. So uh, the fermentation might be slow, but it's not, it won't go terribly long. Okay. Yeah. And also, were the green onions and the chives supposed to be with the Napa cabbage in the brining, oh, I think? No, no, the brining is only for the Napa cabbage. The chive and the green onion is just to chop them. Um, we'll mix them all together later. But 
Okay. It's good to have washed and chopped. And I have one third of Korean red chili powder. It's gochugaru. Uh, depending on each brand and where it's coming from, the spiciness really differs. Um, so if you're type that do not type of people who do not like so spicy, uh, maybe go less than one third of cup. But usually uh, the level of spiciness I have here, one third of gochugaru or the Korean red chili powder, is like the a uh, little bit spicy when you order taco. When they ask you how spicy do you want your taco, I say uh, just medium or little bit. And, and it's that amount of spiciness that you'll taste with the one third of uh, gochugaru. And of course, sugar. Again, this is only one way of making kimchi. So if you go online, Google it, there's so many different ways of making kimchi. So just think about that. And okay, I put my water here. And mix all this ingredient. Um, the question was how much water? I think you said a third of a cup. Yes, a third of a cup. Yes. Okay. I'm going to mute myself so that you don't hear the sound of my mixer, the blender here. Make sure they're thoroughly cut into smaller pieces that creates like a sauce. All right. You go. This is how it should look like, sort of like this. And it smells good for me, at least. <laughs> I hope it smells good for you too. All right, then I'm going to move to my kitchen um, to wash our brined uh, cabbages. I will, I will ask some of your questions when he's back in his kitchen with his headphones on. But allergies is, yeah, there's often ways to work around it. Um, uh, the rice is cooked. That one I can answer. It's cooked rice. Uh, yes, and the and ginger, are, yeah. ginger should okay. be added. Okay, so that, yeah, the rice should be cooked and um, ginger, onion, and garlic, everything was in the blender. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it's sticky rice. Somebody asked, sticky normal or, oh, brown. Um, yeah. Uh, but it was sticky, sticky rice you used. Rice I use. Actually, I use half and half. I don't eat only sticky rice. I use half brown, half um, just white rice. Um, that's what I choose. But if it is sticky rice, the fermentation process happens quicker. Okay. Yeah. And somebody's right. wondering about allergies, so adapting recipes. And one was about allergies in the to the cabbage family. So wondering if cucumber kimchi is free of, like, so that eliminates radishes. So is cucumber kimchi free of the cabbage family ingredients? That's right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, keep, you could keep on asking questions. What, what, okay. what we want to do is we now have grinded our uh, cabbages for 40 minutes. So I'm going to wash them. I'm not going to wash thoroughly because we still want some saltiness there. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to fill up the water and then just pour out the water using my colander. And I will just take that step of the washing of this salt here. Thank 
that looks a good amount of water. I'm going to empty the water. Make sure that water is fully in or um, empty as much as possible. All right, I washed all the salts, excess of salts inside here. What we're going to do with your chopped chive and green onion, we'll put it here. And I'm going to carry this container to my dining room. Give me a second here. All right, and this is the process. This is the stage where we all mix the kimchi sauce. I'll pour this sauce. Here in the container. All right. And we need to mix all this sauce throughout the container and the ingredients thoroughly. In order to do that, what I do is I use this plastic glove because there's spicy stuff here, garlic and onion. And if you don't use some kind of glove, your fingers and hand might be irritated. But feel free to use spoon, spatula, or whatever different ways of one to mix them. Make sure they are mixed thoroughly, well balanced, interspersed. How's everyone doing? at least the people um, who are making ginchi. Is this confusing? Are you doing correctly? Do you miss a, a step? Or is your eyes hurting? Well, I realized I used anchovy paste instead of sauce. What difference will that make? Hmm. Well, as for the taste, I don't, Thing will make any any big difference. Yeah, I I learned today right right in this session that there's a difference between sauce and paste. <laughs> oh, okay. like I didn't know there were. Yeah, I just read anchovy sauce and said, oh, oh I have not I have that in my fridge. Oh, so it's yeah. you know it's experimenting, it's learning and figuring it out. Yeah, and who knows by experimenting you might have the greatest kimchi ever made in our history. Who knows? And who will judge that? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Somebody, Finosi says he may change his job from cleaner to chef. Watch out children, you may have to do dishes. I think that's referring to his family. Mm -hmm. Or, or Finosi, do you see yourself as a cleaner at MCEC? Are you cleaning up, uh, cleaning us up? No, no, I'm the house cleaner in my house. <laughs> Dishwasher, <laughs> laundry, all that. But now I'm going to change my job. <laughs> okay. Excellent. <laughs> Pablo, so this, yes, 
Pablo, since children are an important part of the church, mm -hmm. um, some people call them the minor prophets. Um, mm. Can we meet your little girl? Oh, yeah. Um, the little girl just came back. I thought I saw uh, outside. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I'll make sure to show her before we end our session here. Yeah. All right. And this is how it sort of look like. Um, so this is the end of our second stage. Before we stuff them into jar and other, I will just cover the container. So that we could continue the rest of our workshop. I just want to check in with people who are making kimchi. Um, is everything going okay? Did something explode? Um, did you spill something? <laughs> are your children happy about the smell? It is what it is. I think it smells great. I but mine doesn't look anything like yours. It's I put too much in the blender, I think, because it's ours is not chunky and it's very red. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's because of the uh, gochukaru or the Korean spicy powder. Depending where you bought, depending on the brand, it looks a little bit differently. And, the taste might be similar or the level of spiciness will be different, but it looks good to me. But well, but uh, we, I really chopped up the chives really tiny and the uh, apples and stuff went in the blender. It's okay. It won't, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It won't influence that. Yeah. Okay. The taste will be the same. All right. Perhaps um, we could take a screenshot of all the of people holding up their kimchi because that also is a metaphor for how uh, how we interpret a recipe, what the exact ingredients we use, but the diversity of our kimchi. Mine is also very red, so mm. that would be a good a good picture for us. Should we take picture at the end? Yeah, so that I, I think does that make sense picture? to do it at the end? Okay. Okay. And I'm Wonderful. assuming. Uh, Lisa or Ellen or Joan can do the screenshot or Molly. Excellent. I guess it's and multiple screens, but. That's right. And again, um, doing building community, we all should be flexible. Make kimchi making should be also flexible. All right. Um, before we, we should slowly start to end with our session here. But, um, so I want to go to, uh, before going to our second breakout room, I want to show you some slides about how we can move our church to become uh, more intercultural. I'm going to also send this chart to you uh, with the authors and the copyright information due to the space of the PowerPoint I couldn't add here. But after, when I send out the kimchi recipe, I'll make sure to include this uh, in the file. But this is a continuum of becoming anti-racist and intercultural church, not only in the individual level, but institutional level as well. As we have been talking about differences, um, the first, the, the stage where it's just extremely toward the left or toward the end of respecting and embracing diversity is, as you all know, being exclusive. And from an individual standpoint, uh, people, of course, this is just a chart. I don't believe one per, you could categorize a certain people in one group. We are all mixed in between. And so uh, I don't want to give you a sense that there are certain group of people doing like that. But there are some people who think in this way that um, individual experiences and their culture as the only real and the race as the norm other cultures or race are not noticed or understood in a, or understood in a simplistic manner. So these people in this category think my way is thy way or my way is God's way. And of course, this is more, and having an institution with people with this mentality creates 
a segregated institution. And you can read more about that aspects here in the chart. I'm not going to read them because it's written here. And also, I don't think we have uh, that extreme segregated community is in our MCEs. The next step um, is being passive. And these people in this category think that, well, yes, there's some diversity out there. Still, my way is the best way. Um, and so then we need to teach people, other people to be more like us because they need our help. And this is what's in a, from an institutional perspective, it creates a club institution, it tolerate a limited number of BIPOC with proper perspective and credentials, uh, may still secretly limit or exclude BIPOC in contradiction. I, see, I put here BIPOC, but you could add any groups that you, are, that you could consider as the other. Uh, also, there's a continue to intentionally maintain white power and privilege through its formal policy and practices, teachings and decision-making on all level of institutional life. And they often say, we don't have a problem. Next, we have a symbolic change. Uh, feel like we need to do some changes because there seems to be some need and there's some symbolic change happening where individuals recognize some diversity out there, but still deeply inside of one thoughts and belief is that there's a universal values and that my way of theology and my way of understanding and seeing the world is universal. And some people just need to notice that or learn that. And this creates a multicultural institutions where uh, make official policy pronouncement regarding multicultural diversity, open doors to BIPOC, carry intentional inclusive, inclusiveness efforts, recruiting some, not some of people of uh, person of color, um, but just limit the institutional change. And then there's another uh, further down, there's an identity change where one finally realized, oh yes, my way of thinking is not the only way. There are so many different ways to see the world. And my culture, my race is just one of many. And this create, and, and by doing, by having this belief, uh, people in this group create an anti-racist institution where, where people train for a growing understanding of racism and the barriers that excludes certain group of people, uh, sponsor anti-racism training, uh, develop identity as anti-racist and all these great ideas. But from, my from a structural and systemic and cultural aspect, uh, still maintain the dominant power and privileges and they are not changed. Then further along, we have a, what's happening, there's a structural change that's happening in this process. It's not only an individual, but structural change where we look into the policy, our culture, our institution and bylaws and see how could we really make this in shape in a way that is inclusive and respect engaged people from diverse ethno-cultural and other uh, backgrounds. Um, you could read further here. Uh, there's an implement structures, policy, and practices with inclusive decision making, other form of power sharing on all levels of the institutions, life, and work. Commit to struggle to dismantle racism in the wider community and build clear lines of accountability to racially oppressed community. And toward the end, there's the fully inclusive community where one's experience of self includes movement in and out of different cultural and racial worldviews. And this not only seek for a one institution to be transformed, but also engage in our society to bring social transformation. Um, so these are the, this, what I'm showing is a chart of a continuum. And in your small groups, I want to ask you to discuss the following questions. Uh, where is your church on this continuum? Again, as I said earlier, uh, 
one category can't explain everything about your church. Some people might think in this in this aspect, I think our church could be fully inclusive. But in at this aspect, I think we are more uh, in other level. Feel free to talk in that way. Don't um, be stick to the chart. Um, second question: What can you do to move to the next stage? And lastly, what support does your church need to move forward? And with this question, I invite you to go to your small groups and to discuss for eight minutes. Great. I would like to invite maybe uh, two to three people to speak up uh, what has been discussed in your, dis in your small group. And the rest, feel free to use the chat features. And, toward, and after that, I believe Marilyn will be reading some of your comments on the chat box. But I want to invite maybe two or three people to briefly share what had been discussed. I think in our group, Fenosi really identified a very important feature, which is that in a lot of our churches, there's this ideal of competency for leadership. People have certain skills, language abilities, communication abilities, and that is not considered to be a, it's a very innocent value that we have that we think is important. And yet it makes it very difficult then to have this sense of including people who don't have those competencies and causes us toward lean to have act in ways that are actually racist and and um, it's a very real problem that I have seen happen. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for the comment. Someone else? In our group there were several of us who I identified from very recent new Canadians to myself <laughs> way, way back in the 40s and 50s when there was this uh, challenge of being uh, you know, uniquely separate and the, the challenge of uh, assimilation and uh, age differences. Uh, as a, for me, it was an era, a time when I felt rebellious, anti-traditional, anti-German, uh, mainly the language, not the people so much, but et cetera. But I think was very important was I always had experienced a, a friendly atmosphere, a child and youth friendly congregation, uh, which helped uh, certainly facilitated my continued interest in staying within the church. I see similar but different parallels happening right now. And I wonder if some of that isn't almost more theological than it was compared to cultural differences. So we get the, the more tolerant and the more conservative or whatever you want to say, opinions, and we, we struggle with that. Thanks. There's a few written comments in the chat. One group um, commented that it would be good to discuss this question within the congregations. It's hard to know where everyone is at uh, and exam uh, reactions to a, a racism series uh, are, is the experience in some. Um, question about whether the slides will be available and yes, all slides and recipes and presentation will be available next week. Um, our, um, a comment that our administrative processes are also culturally grounded. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Very good comments. Things to consider as we move forward throughout this annual gathering. Um, I just wish I could have the whole day to have this good discussion, but we only have five more minutes left. Um, so it's about, it's time to conclude. Um, you know, um, we put, I have my kimchi here in this container. I going, I personally going to just leave it like this and um, just put it out there, but out in my, in, in my room. But if you want to, you could feel free to stuff your kimchi into a jar. Uh, but there's a warning. When you put kimchi in this jar, uh, you need to give some space because if it is just fully packed the kimchi, remember uh, the fermentation is happening. And when fermentation happens, it releases gas. And if you fully packed the jar and put it in the refrigerator, 
next day something horrible could happen within your refrigerator. <laughs> so to avoid that, uh, give some space so that uh, yeah, so that it doesn't your lid doesn't explode. All right. Um, also, uh, this I recommend you to leave your kimchi in your whatever you're comfortable in a room temperature area for 10 hours. It depends what kind of taste you prefer. There's people who like eating right away from this stage, but then there are people who like to eat when fermentation sort of happened. And so for that to help with the fermentation, I encourage you to put in the room temperature area around 10 hours. Of course, that will depend how much fermented shrimp you have put, how uh, sticky was the rice and all other elements. But I encourage you to put it somewhere around 10. And if you like that taste after that, you could put it in the refrigerator. Put it in the refrigerator won't stop the process of fermentation, but it will slow down. And so you could enjoy the similar taste uh, longer. Again, uh, every day as it ferments, you the taste will be sharper and a little bit more tangier. Um, so it will be good to consume before it gets very, uh, it get, before it gives a sharper and more tender taste. Uh, and as you could taste the kimchi a bit process, when you eat the cabbage, the cabbage will just taste like cabbage, but a little bit more spicy. But longer it's fermented, the cabbage, you, the taste of the cabbage will be transformed as well as chive and green onion. It's no longer a simple cabbage. It's no longer a simple a green onion or chive. It's something more. So then there's this unity. But at the same time, there's a uniqueness from of each ingredient still existing there. So that's why I believe uh, kimchi is a better metaphor than melting pot and the mosaic. And of course, there could be more uh, a different type of better metaphors. And if they are, feel free to suggest to me and next time we could create that food or that element together. Um, also, as we end, um, I want to encourage, I know Leah have already introduced this, but I want to uh, introduce this book as well. It's Intercultural Church. So what Marzouk have written this book and it really talks about it gives the theological and biblical perspective of why we need to be an intercultural church. Uh, in a nutshell, we're not becoming intercultural church because there's so many diversity around us, but rather becoming intercultural church is God's vision toward the church and toward the society. And we as a Mennonite churches, as we become intercultural church, we can witness to the world that this is the way how God has shaped and created us to be a really authentic church that respect res uh, differences and engage with differences. That's all I have prepared. Um, is there any comment, question? We only have one to two minutes. And before we end, I do really want to ask me, I think Marilyn suggests they want to take pictures of people who have made kimchi. Uh, maybe it is to you, Marilyn, uh, how you want to live from here. Well, I think there was a, a question about can can you freeze the frozen uh, the final product and and pull it out later? And is there anything to add that could stop the fermentation at the level that you want it? Well, for the second question, I don't think there's a way to stop the fermentation since already there's sort of like the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, but freezing, I, you know, I never tried that. Uh, well, if you like that, I encourage you to do and let us know by next week um, what happened. I'm very curious to learn about that. There you go. Sounds like a great experiment. Pablo, the chat is filled with um, lots of thanks and appreciation to you for doing this workshop, for your thoughtful um, engagement of the metaphor and giving us so much to, um, so much that can ferment in us. So thank you. Oh, I, thank you. Uh, please read the chat. Um, I think, yeah, you'll have access to it. So please read it. It's filled with thanks. Mm. Oh, and my last comment is that um, 
as you take this journey of becoming into cultural church, uh, be aware that you will be transformed. It's not the only the other who get transformed, but we all will end up transforming. And also becoming an intercultural church is always tricky, messy, and smelly. But still, we need to take this journey because it is God's vision revealed to us through the Bible. So blessing to you all as you take this journey. Maybe we should take pictures of the kids. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm I'm not I'm not a tech person. Somebody suggested if you didn't make kimchi, turn your video off because Zoom prioritizes the videos of uh, pe pe people who have their videos on. So if you've made kimchi, leave your video on and let's hold it up, and um, we'll let we'll let the fine MCEC tech staff start taking screenshots. So, ooh, the smell comes. <laughs> 